So I was asked to speak here today on the topic of the High Court's love decision. Uh, they told me to speak for 20 to 25 minutes to be followed by questions. Nothing else. They told me all you need is love, which as it happens isn't the worst five word description of the majority decision. Apologies to Mr. Lennon and Mr. McCartney. So at any rate, I'm taking the organizers at their word and also as a sort of tribute to the sheer brilliance uh, with which coalition governments these last seven years have made appointments to the High Court, uh, I'd like to do something a little bit unique because remember, of the four justices in the Love majority, three were appointed by the coalition, the most recent three appointees to the court, in fact, all having been picked by that to uh, outstanding latter-day John Stuart Mill clone and former Liberal Attorney General George Brandis. Uh, what I'm proposing as a tribute to the skill with which the Liberals have appointed top judges to the High Court is that about halfway through this talk today I'm going to retire and I'll be replaced by my wife. Now you might think that this is some this would constitute some sort of world first but if so you're not uh, overly familiar with Mr. Brandis's approach to making appointments to our High Court. And let me just say as an aside that I actually still get constitutional law professors from overseas email me and ask, did that really happen? Did the Australian government really choose as the retiring, the replacement for the retiring justice, his wife? I suppose that all you can say on the bright side is that at least in this one small way, uh, coalition governments uh, have taken the family seriously. At any rate, my first inclination of being asked to do this talk, and knowing it only have 20 minutes to cover a pretty thick case, lots of footnotes, the regular 4 million footnotes, was to take you on a survey, I want to take you all on a survey of some rather dry constitutional law concepts. The sort of terms of constitutional art, and deep legal significance, the top barristers and top judges are more or less forced to immerse themselves in when it comes to the, the finer intricacies of constitutional law. So what I was tempted to do uh, was to take a look at the majority decision in love and select some of the, the key concepts that drove the thinking of the judges who were in the four person majority. So here we would, have, we would have had to open up the constitutional law textbooks and delve into the meaning of such arcane legal concepts and I am not making this up, but concepts such as Otherness. I'm going to say that again, otherness, because I've been teaching now in universities for about 31 years, and in that entire 31 years, I've never encountered a case where a judge decides that case, uh, and this notion of otherness plays a core role in the ratio. So, otherness. Uh, or, and all of these are uh, quotes, deeper truths, or when it comes to Australia, connections that are spiritual and metaphysical and using all of these core legal precepts and more and then combining them together in a sort of uh, holistic alternative medicine brew to claim that judge-made law now recognizes, and this is a quote, that indigenous peoples can and do possess certain rights and duties that are not possessed by and cannot be possessed by non-indigenous peoples of Australia. Um, all, of the, all of those come from Justice Gordon, Many of you might know her as Mrs. Hain. That's the Brandis appointee who replaced her husband in a literal world first. And if that doesn't exemplify the genius of the Liberal Party as well as anything, I don't know what does. Um, of course, all of us could sit around in one of those postmodernist grievance politics type classes that uh, are scattered around so many of Australia's universities. And uh, we could sit in on some seminars in an attempt to have a glimmer of a smidgen of a hint of an idea of what otherness actually means or what otherness is uh, because truth be told I haven't really got a clue. But then perhaps instead we can move on to Justice Nettle. This was another Brandis appointee so obviously he must be a rock-solid interpretive conservative not prone to judicial activism, not prone to flights of fancy and uh, certainly above succumbing to identity politics. In his judgment and love Justice Nettle talks of and again these are quotes of how different considerations apply to a person of Aboriginal descent. Now, if you're like me, you might wonder why different considerations would apply in a liberal democracy that's committed to the rule of law and to formal equality, as opposed to a jurisdiction, say, that's committed to the sort of identity politics that uh, 
the British author Douglas Murray skewers so magnificently in his latest book, and let me as an aside recommend that. The Madness of Crowds by Douglas Murray is absolutely superb. Um, but still, different considerations apply for Aboriginal people, apparently, and we know that because that's what Justice Nettle tells us. And if you're skeptical about that, Justice Nettle goes on to re-educate you by noting that the Commonwealth's claims to the contrary, and this is a quote, intuitively appear at odds with the growing recognition of Aboriginal peoples as the original inhabitants of Australia. And then he goes on and says, and of their essential spiritual connection with country. So you're now in a position to realize that our top judges, unelected each and every one, uh, now decide key constitutional law cases based on intuitions. Uh, intuitions that provide them with some sort of ineffable expertise as far as discerning, and again, this is a quote, growing recognitions is concerned. Now we don't, recognitions by whom we aren't told, uh, but I have to be honest, uh, I would have thought that if you were looking for the group of people who were least likely to have their fingers on the pulse of what the community does and doesn't recognize, you'd be very hard pressed to do better than choose a cocooned committee of ex-barrists or top judges who every day, day in and day out are genuflected to for obvious reasons by just about everyone they encounter. Um, still, I'm prepared to defer to Justice Nettle here. These top unelected judges, continues Justice Nettle, are also able to discern, again a quote, essential spiritual connections. I don't know how, maybe they get special training on this once they're appointed to the high court. Maybe they've spent some time reading Arthur Conan Doyle's essays on spiritualism, who knows. But let me note too, and I think this is particularly pathetic, that Justice Nettle put country in, square, in sort of scare quotes. So it's not country, it's country. And either that's some sort of genuflection in the direction of identity politics, or his law clerks uh, were being overly careful about plagiarism concerns leave that for you to decide. But the key takeaway here is that we have yet more crucial constitutional law co concepts that have been thrown into the mix. So we've now got essential spiritual connections with country, and remember to put country in scare quotes, and that joins together with otherness, with deeper truths, as things that a committee of unelected ex-lawyers tell us they have extra special expertise about. Again, we don't, we're not really sure why they have expert expertise in that area, and which they're able to use to remove decision-making power away from the elected parliament, because that's exactly what they do in love, and all because they've given the power to do this to themselves. Um, as I learned in uh, university, and this is a good time to say mirabili dictu. If all of this sounds as though I'm less than enamored with the quality of the reasoning of the majority judges in this case, then you have extra special powers of discernment to pick up these subtle criticisms of mine. But wait, there's more. The third Brandis appointee to the High Court, the most recent was Justice Edelman. Now maybe we could hope that at least he would shun the idiocies of a bizarre sort of judicial activism that's premised on the worst sort of political correctness. Of course, to ask is to know the answer. The answer is no. Justice Edelman in his judgment talks of, these are all quotes, essential meanings, metaphysical constructs, powerful personal attachments to land. And then this is remarkable, I think. He says, and this is a quote, to, te to treat differences as though they were alike is not equality. It is denial of community. Any tolerant view of community must recognize that community is based on difference. I'm gonna be honest, I have no idea, I have no clear idea what that means, but uh, neither it nor any of the other political ramblings have anything to do with the judge's assigned task, which is to interpret a constitution. And if you want to talk about formal equality of the sort that underlies the rule of law, then in my view, I didn't think this was too controversial, but treating those claiming Aboriginal ancestry the same as you treat everyone else is not denial of community. It's how any decent jurisdiction committed to liberal democracy acts. Because of course, the Edelman political ramblings about community could justify any group anywhere getting special treatment. Does affording the Boers special treatment in the 1970s get a tick because you don't want to indulge in, and I quote, denial of that community? Or because, and I quote, community is based on difference? I mean, let's be blunt. All this Gordon, Nettle, Edelman stuff is just about the worst sort of mumbo jumbo that's ever been used in a constitutional law judgment. 
And believe me, there is some pretty amazingly tough competition for the prize of worst ever judicial mumbo jumbo. Um, at any rate, you'll all be glad to know that I, that I ended up opting to resist the temptation to walk you through the core constitutional concepts that were employed by the three recent liberal appointees to our high court in love. Okay, well, I didn't, I didn't wholly resist the temptation to point out some of these lunatic postmodernist steeped in identity politics, blatantly activist enhancing comments of these three coalition, let me keep saying this, coalition appointees to the high court. I couldn't completely resist because I'm just, I'm only human. I'm a bit like, uh, anyway. That said, let me move on now to a more orthodox account of this case. Even though in many ways, I think the most important criticism of, you can make of the entire case is the one I've just sort of tried to humorously run, run you through in an expedited fashion. And that's that supposed interpreters of our written constitution, which is one of the world's oldest, what are we, the fourth or fifth oldest written constitution, it's clearly one of the most successful written constitutions. The people who are, are employed to interpret it have decided to trade in their jobs as interpreters of legal text for the far more invigorating job of identity politics professors. Sort of latter-day Professor Foucault's who've been given license, well actually they gave themselves license, to make social policy over the heads of the elected parliament. They didn't like what the parliament did and based on nothing other than what looks like identity politics, uh, subjective ramblings have uh, decided that they can make policy over the heads of the parliament. Now, there are two looming retirements on the high court. Nettle goes this December, and as an aside, I'm told his wife is pretty excited about her uh, prospects of uh, picking up the empty vacancy. And uh, Justice Bell, uh, she retires in March of next year. Now, both were in the majority in this case. And I'm just going to tell you flat out that my desire is that we get two, not one, because you can sort of predict that uh, the Attorney General will make one sort of half-hearted con constitutional conservative, and then he'll cave into the demands of uh, identity politics. We will see. But at any rate, my desire is to get two interpretive conservatives. By that, I mean people who see their job as delivering the outcomes that were intended by the legitimate makers of the law, which is not them. Um, so two interpretive conservatives from the Attorney General Porter, and that at some point, once they're in place and a case that's broadly similar to this one can be found, it's appealed back to the High Court, the newly constituted High Court, with the Solicitor General being, don't be a wimp. It drives me crazy about Australian constitutional laws whenever the High Court is activist, the way they were in Roach or Roe or Brown, the next case that comes along, the Solicitor General goes in and he argues the case effectively by genuflecting to the earlier case that was completely implausibly reasoned. And the, maybe the worst example of that was Roe, where the, the Solicitor General conceded everything and it was just pathetic because Roach was a terrible decision. So instead of the usual Solicitor General um, invertebrate type uh, approach, Instead, I would like the associate to go into the newly constituted High Court, whenever that is, 2021, 2022, and flat out argue that love is bad law, terrible law, and that the High Court, the government's position is that the High Court has to overturn its own precedent. I even go so far as to tell the Solicitor General that the government will continue to make this argument for the foreseeable future, whatever the High Court decides. That's a digression. Here's my quick summary of the love case. It's not as quick as the one I gave by the Beatles above, all you need is love, but it's pretty quick. So this case on the question of deporting plaintiffs who are born outside Australia, who are foreign citizens, who have not been naturalized or made Australian citizens, in fact, they chose not to become Australian citizens uh, through uh, laziness or whatever, but who claim to be Aborigines, and the more astute listeners will have picked this up already, but I think it was a disgrace. Um, by four to three, it effectively constitutionalized identity politics. In a weird sort of way, it elevated the common law. So for the non-lawyers, judge-made law above the Constitution itself. It introduced a race-based limit on Parliament's power. It looked very much to, to me to be a clear case of orient, uh, outcome-oriented judging, meaning you start with the conclusion you want, and then you struggle uh, to find rationales to get you there. Um, Amusingly or depressingly, it depends on your cast of mind, 
In case more or less ignored or abandoned the established heads of powers, interpretive methods. So these are the ones that to my mind, uh, when it comes to federalism, have unfortunately been used by our top court to deliver uh, the most pro-center federalism case law in the world. So I don't like them, but they were completely ignored by the majority in this case out of the blue. Um, in the most odd situation where no Australian state actually benefited from this new approach to heads of powers interpretation. And lastly, given the tools the, judge, the judges had to work with, I think it's now fair to say that this love case means our top judges are vying for the title of the most activist judges in the common law world. Because remember, um, in most jurisdictions, the judges have a bill of rights of some version, entrenched or statutory, which gives them plenty of scope to make things up. It's a lot harder in Australia for the point of application interpreters, the judges, to make things up. And uh, you know the skill with the, the the way they did it in this case puts them right up there with, in my view, with the world's most activists. So what I'm going to do with the rest of my time, because there's all sorts of ways you could look at this case, I'm just going to pick one. It's an unusual aspect of the Love case, and it relates to federalism because that's a core concern of this society. And that'll take up my assigned time. So after that, we can move to questions. I'm happy to take questions on anything except otherness. Um, maybe Stuart can tell us something about otherness, I don't know. Or you can send off an email to Justice Gordon. And again, some of you might know her as Mrs. Hain. Um, let me start with a short and therefore highly generalized digression. I wanna compare the approach to federalism judicial review of legislation. We're talking strong judicial review, not judicial review of administrative action, but judicial review of legislation. And so federalism, judicial review of legislation that's done in Canada as opposed to in Australia. A quick overview of both of those. So in my native Canada, where there's a two list system of federalism, because effectively in the democratic world, there's two versions, I generalize, but there's two versions of federalism. You can have a two list version or a one list version. And Canada has a two list version where you uh, have one list that enumerates the center's heads of powers and a separate list that enumerates the province's heads of powers and then basically in Canada, not completely, but basically everything not on either list goes to the center. And that was a, that two list version was chosen because the thinking was that this would create a very strong central government. And that, that was, the reasons for that are pretty obvious. It was 1867, was Canada federated two years after the American Civil War. There was this huge Union army parked on Canada's uh, southern border. Um, 50 years earlier, the Americans had invaded out of the blue in the War of 1812. Um, Americans don't learn this anymore, but we, in Canada we did. We won. I'm sure they still don't learn that in Canada anymore. Um, we won because it was a draw. At any rate, the, the idea of having two lists is to really uh, cabin or bracket what the provinces could do. It, it hasn't turned out that way. Canada's provinces are pretty much second only to Switzerland's cantons in terms of their power. Um, for the gentleman earlier who was a skeptic of federalism, I might just point out that the richest countries in the democratic world are all federations. The poorer ones like France are highly centralized. And the way that federalism works is that you have competition. Um, three, 30 states in the U.S. are now open for business. California and New York aren't. They're left to make decisions and they pay the costs of their decisions. We don't, they, you know, in a proper system, you don't have an insane horizontal fiscal escalation equalization formula so that states that refuse to allow fracking get to take the money of states that do. Um, again, we have the worst of both worlds. We are effectively running a centralized system in Australia under the guise of federalism. But in real federal systems, Germany, Switzerland, Canada, the US, they are wealthy. And they have fewer bureaucrats per head of population. And in the Canadian federal system with two lists of powers, the approach to, the judge's approach to interpreting that, very different to here. Um, it came out of the Privy Council in London in the 19th century. It's still unquestioned orthodox today. Same, same as I learned when I went through law school in Canada. And the test, and this is really fast, but the test centers on what's known as the law's pith and substance. So you as a judge take a contested law and you ask yourself, what is this law's pith and substance? What is its essential character? What does it in substance relate to? So let's say you decide that this contested statute or challenge statute in substance relates to X, X being one of the heads of powers on one of the two lists. 
So that's where it, that's where it's uh, in substance relates to. But incidentally, and you know, less substantively, it might touch on uh, heads of powers Y and Z on the other list. Well, in that case, the challenged or contested law is intravires the legislative competence of the X list, the one that contains head of power X. Which, so again, if you want me to put this in different terms. Canada, in effect, has a two-step process. Firstly, the judges say, what is the pith and substance of the statute that's being impugned or contested or challenged? And then secondly, you take that essential character, that pith and substance, and you ask which head of power it most fully falls under. Is it a Section 91 head of power, Section 91 in Canada's old British North America Act, or the powers that Ottawa get, center, or does it fit better, more substantively, under one of the Section 92 powers that are the province's ones, right? Now, compare that to Australia's approach to federalism, judicial review, and again, this is fast, but my colleague here at University of Queensland, Nick Aroni, he and I are probably the only two right of center constitutional law professors in the country, so of course we would never get any ARC grants or even anything because, of course, it's a sea of left-wing people out there but um, uh, Nick Aroni labels the Australian approach interpretive literalism. And to be clear, we're talking now about the post-1920 approach that flowed after the engineer's case, so the last hundred years. So how does it work? Again, in very general terms, uh, how does it work here? Because we copied the US approach to federalism, that's the other main type where you have one list. And so what you do is you have one list of powers, the centers, and everything that doesn't go to the center goes to the states. And of course, ironically, the thinking by the founding fathers in the US and here is that that sort of one list setup would create stronger states than a two list Canadian setup. And of course, one of the ironies of history is that uh, top judges have made sure that's not true. So, um, you know, it, ironically, even in the, the U.S. have much stronger states than we do here in Australia, but they're not as strong as Canadian provinces, and our states are completely and totally emasculated. I think we're the only federation in the democratic world where the states don't have income tax power. The only thing I ever like, um, tenure as prime minister, is when he offered the states income tax power. The morons, even the one, even the liberal ones, they turned them down. I mean, it, this just shows you how men, how the mindset of these mendicants. Um, at any rate, uh, what you where where we are is that you in Australia you look at the one list, the Section Fifty One heads of powers, as a judge, and you read these heads of powers um, as widely and liberally as the words used permit, or as one of the minority judges said in love with all the generality which the words used permit. So basically you take the heads of powers and you just read them in an incredibly expansive way. And then you ask if the contested statute can fit under any of those Canberra, Commonwealth, Section 51 heads of powers read in this wide, broad, liberal, uber friendly to the Commonwealth way. If you can do that, then it's a power for the Commonwealth. And if you can't, it's for the states. Now, it doesn't take a complete genius to realize that the Australian approach to federalism um, judicial review is remarkably friendly to the center. Um, it's, it's why I think we have what is probably the world's most pro-center federalism jurisprudence. I'm going to skip over whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Most Australians, almost all the students I get, they're the best ones in the state of Queensland or people you talk to, are clearly centralists. It's just not true in Canada. It's not true in um, uh, the US and it's not true in Germany, but here most people I generalize, um, maybe I've been taking the spiritualist classes that uh, Justice Nettle's gone to, are centralists, they think it's a good thing. Most members of the Samuel Griffith Society, the, this cult to which I'm speaking, are not centralists, and they tend to think it's a bad thing. Um, as, a, as a commentary, I would say that I think it's fair to say that none of the framers, and this is just an empirical assertion, of Australia's constitution over a century ago would ever in their wildest dreams have imagined that Australian states would be as emasculated as they are today. Um, and I use emasculated in the non, in the pejorative sense, not the sense that Clementine Ford would use it in. Um, none would have anticipated that say the corporation's power, that's section 
5120 would be held to allow the Commonwealth to take over the field of industrial relations, remarkable, um, or the external affairs power with a 5129 would be deemed to enable the Commonwealth to enact far-reaching environmental and human rights law. Let me put it in the comparative terms I just approached. If Canada's approach to federalism judicial review had been used in uh, the Tasmanian Dam case, sorry, the Tasmanian Dam case, or in the work choices case, then the states would have won and the center would have lost. I mean, we basically have an approach to constitute uh, federalism judicial review that makes it extremely difficult for states to win. So why do I bring that ancient history up? I mean, it's not part of a James Allen ritualized lament about the woeful state of federalism in Australia. I'm not against regularly making that lament, but I'm bringing it up now um, for a different reason, because in theory, the Love case was a federalism heads of powers case, or head of power case. So what you would have assumed going in is that we'd be playing the interpretive literalism game. You know, we'd assume that we'd, what we'd see is something, something roughly along the lines of the, say, the same-sex marriage case, the Commonwealth and the ACT from 2013, you know, where the high court reads the head of power, and that one it was 51, 21, the marriage head of power, and they read it in the orthodox, orthodox for Australia, nowhere else, but in the orthodox, wide, liberal, broad, bend over backwards for the Commonwealth way, so that it, you know, so that it included marriages between persons of the same sex. Um, had the High Court of Australia not done that, had it read the head of power more narrowly, or had it read it, say, in line with the framers' intended meaning, then there was a really good chance that the power would not have rested with the center, it would have gone to the states, or in that case, to the ACT. But, of course, that's not the pro-center Australian way. That's not the orthodox approach to federalism just review in this country, like it or lump it. And yet, we get to love, and we see the majority, three of whom were appointed by Mr. Brandis, um, implicitly reject federalism heads of power orthodoxy. So let me be clear. I don't like the orthodox approach to federalism judicial review in this country. I think it's a terrible approach. It completely ignores um, the intended meaning of the people who had the legitimate authority to make and ratify the constitution, but that's where we are. So I merely tell you what it is as a matter of fact, and I note that this love decision is a completely bizarre case to break away from federalism heads of powers orthodoxy because it's a case where no state or no territory gets to benefit. So you pick a case where no state can benefit from rejecting federalism orthodoxy and sort of infringing on the center's power. You would have expected the majority to look at the head of power in play, which is 5119, aliens, naturalization and aliens, and then you'd read that in the sort of broad, wide, liberal, extremely friendly to the Commonwealth manner. So they always do, and then, you know, that's why our states, as I said, are mendicants, why we have the world's worst vertical fiscal imbalance, why we have no concept of competitive federalism, why we have this woeful horizontal fiscal equalization, et cetera, et cetera. John Stone can fill in another 20 for us. Um, that's what they've always done. So using anything remotely coming close to that orthodox approach to federalism just review, you know, if you were uh, predicting, you would have said, well, it looks like a pretty sure thing that the Commonwealth legislation Migration Act, Citizenship Act, is going to stand and these gentlemen are going to be deported. You know, if I can put it in this way, it won't be long before, if I can again return to popular music, love is in the air. Well, that's moving from the Beatles to uh, John Paul Young. But with hardly a mention of why orthodoxy was being jettisoned, that's not what happened in love. It's not the approach that was taken by the, by the majority instead, Staying with popular music, we get the trogs, and love is all around. Um, I have a clip of that if anybody wants to listen to it in uh, question time. But notice that that's doubly unusual here. It's, it's weird almost, and, I, and it's why I say this is outcome-oriented judging, because with federalism judicial review of legislation, unlike with rights-related judicial review of the sort you see in Canada or the U.S. or Germany, or any democracy, South Africa, with a justiciable entrenched bill of rights, right? So unlike that, because with rights-related judicial view, what often happens is the judges will look inside themselves uh, effectively 
give some sort of content to a vague amorphous rights provision and take it off the democratic table for all levels of government. And that's typical of rights-related judicial review. But with federalism judicial review, the judicial task is not that. It's premised on the judges having to choose between two elected legislatures, the center or state, province, lander, canton, whatever. And so judges, when they're doing federalism judicial review, are meant to be acting as umpires. They're not meant to be taking stuff off the democratic table for everyone. They're meant to be saying, one of you two elected legislatures can do this. If legislature X in the country doesn't have the power to do it, or what's trying to be done by the statute, then legislature Y uh, does have the power, or, and vice versa. So it's either the states, provinces can do it, or the center can do it. You know, and as long as there's not any contradiction, maybe they can both do it. Um, but in the Love case, what we're talking about, we're, we're, but in the Love case, we're talking about whether there's a statutory power in effect to deport citizens, sorry, non-citizens, right? Now I figure I'm the most pro-state, pro-states right, sorry, say that again. I figure that I'm just about the most pro-states rights law professor in Christendom. David Flint and I can mud wrestle for the title later, but I'm certainly in the top two, three, right? But if anything is the power that has to go to, cent to the center, it's anything to do with deporting non-citizens. It's obvious that's a power that's gonna to go to the center. And um, so there was never any chance at all that if the Commonwealth could not deport Mr. Love, then one of the states could do it, not a chance. So in effect, the high court majority judges took it away from all elected legislatures. That's what they did. Um, or to put it more bluntly, Bell, Gordon, Nettle, and Edelman turned a heads of power federalism case, because that's what it looks like. On, in form, that's what it is. And they turn it into a sort of rights-related judicial review case. The sort of case that you see all the time if you're forced, as I am, with a gun at my head to read Canadian Bill of Rights, Charter of Rights cases. They, they turn it into a case where no elected body can do what is being proposed to be done in the statute. And that is almost never the scenario with federalism judicial review. Federalism judicial review is if the center can't do it, the states get to, this is, you know, there's dancing in the streets in Brisbane and Sydney because they do get to do it. Remember, we don't have a National Bill of Rights in Australia. Now, I'm the first one to concede that the judges in you know, ACTV and Longy and Roach and Roe and Brown are basically slowly over time constructing what is in effect the Bill of Rights. They're doing it on their own. I think it's totally illegitimate. In question time, I'm perfectly happy to take questions on these cases. Brown is an absolute disgrace. I have something coming out in um, Federal Law Review. It's just come out. You know, Brown is a implied rights pseudo Bill of Rights case where in the 8 million pages and 7 billion footnotes where they strike down Tasmanian legis elected legislation in the Tasmanian Parliament, there's not a single mention of any provision of our constitution. It's absurd. So I recognize that the judges are trying quietly to create a sort of pseudo bill of rights. And I think, you know, it would be nice if Mr. Porter actually appointed a judge who, who started dissenting on those cases too. But we don't have a bill of rights, at least a, a real one that the citizens have uh, confirmed in a referendum or at least had the legislature bring in. So put differently then, the end result in, in love is yet more judicially made up implications. They don't come out the majority and say the way they do in ACTV that, there's, you know, that this is an implied limit on all legislative power. Um, they don't do that, but that's the effect of it. They don't say that this is something that no real life founder ever actually held, but the implication in love is that there is a sort of like identity politics bastardized race-based exception to Section 5119. Uh, it's sort of a constitutional implied limit on Parliament's sovereignty that seems to have nothing to do at all with federalism limits. It has to do with a sort of touchy-feely race-based emoting. So I'll say that again. And you, if you want, you can just compare Australia to New Zealand. New Zealand is the world's last parliamentary sovereignty. Britain is going to go back there when Boris finally it grows a backbone, deals with the virus, and gets, uh, gets Britain out of the EU.
But in a parliamentary sovereignty, there is no legal limit on what the parliament can do. There, are, there is no judicial review of legislation. And our constitution, in a way, was aiming to replicate that as, as far as possible in a federation. So the thinking was, the, really, the only main sort of uh, judicial review of legislation would be federalism. And I don't have a problem with that. Um, but this Love case, on its face, is a federalism judicial review case. And the majority judges, they, they transmogrify it into a, what I'm going to call a bastardized rights-related sort of judicial review case. Um, and you can see that because on their ratio, no elected legislature can deport these men. I mean, assuming they meet the politically correct criteria laid down about who's an aborigine. But assuming you meet that, then nobody can deport you. And, and how did that happen? Well, it happened with a hefty dose of, as I said to start, otherness, deeper truths, different considerations for persons of Aboriginal descent, the keen application of intuitions, because if you want anything out of your top constitutional law judges, you want a keen sense of intuition, you want an, the ability to discern essential spiritual connections, metaphysical constructs, the list of these dry, arcane constitutional concepts uh, continues off across the horizon. Um, looking at the time, I'm going to basically stop. I'll just say that there's a point in Edelman's uh, judgment where he hints that this doesn't really matter because it's not really going to apply to too many people. Um, that's debatable, but whether it's true or not, this is a constitutional law case. It is not a tort law case where it might be relevant that the particular area of negligence law is only going to affect one, one, out of, one person every century. This is a, the core thing about constitutional cases is that you're laying down an approach to interpreting the document. That's what matters. And their approach to interpreting this document is appalling. And again, I will completely finish by saying this case was brought to you by a coalition government for seven years of coalition governments who appointed far worse top judges than labor. Look at Gagler's um, judgment, look at uh, uh, Keynes, just orthodox constitutional interpretation. I don't like the, uh, the sort of orthodox approach to federalism, but that's what, that's what you get. And in fact, if anything, Gagler gives you a little more oomph. Um, so right now we're in this weird world where the, the, the most constitutionally conservative judges were appointed by labor. And the three picks we've had from um, this series of supposedly um, sort of liberal governments have been appalling. Um, I could go on, but I think I've done enough. I'll open it up for questions if that's okay, John.